All right, and welcome back to Life Changing Challengers. Again, I'm your host, Brad Minus, and I am so very honored to have Dana Diaz with me. She is the author of Gasping for Air, The Stranglehold of Narcissistic Abuse, and she calls herself an author and a voice for victims' abuse. So welcome, Dana. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited always to have this conversation because unfortunately too many people can relate. So we got to help them out. Yes. And that's what we're here to do. Right. And as I always said, if any of you have a connection with the content that I'm bringing you and you get one nugget out of it, I've done my job and you've got something and you've got something to take away and always leave uh, comments and I always give contact information at the end so you can keep your journey going. But let's start out with how this came about. So Dana, can you just give us a little background on your childhood, where you grew up, what was the compliment to your house? And, and what was it like to grow up in, in the Chicago land area? <laughs> oh, well, discuss the weather. Anybody that lives in the Midwest knows that the, the weather is always a thing. But, you know, I've been in it all my life, so it doesn't phase me. Just you get used to it. But the childhood, that's always been the big question because people read my book and this toxic, awful relationship and how it grew into domestic violence. And like, then they meet me and they're like, but how did you end up in that situation? Like you're strong and you're this, and you're intelligent. And I'm like, yeah, but it happens to the best of us. But I think that the core of how it happens does go back to how we were raised. I think that most people don't realize that Children are, forgive the wording, but we're hardwired by the time we're about seven years old as to family dynamics, roles, the way the world works generally based on what we see around us. And I had unfortunately been born to a teenage mother back in the seventies when it wasn't okay to be a pregnant teenager. So life was difficult, very difficult for her. As you can imagine, a lot of judgments, a lot of shame at school and her family. There was a lot she dealt with, but the problem where it came to affect me and still affects me to this day, and I'm 48 years old, is that I don't think she wanted children, but she certainly made sure that I paid the price for everything she went through during her pregnancy with me. So I was born actually, ironically, on her 17th birthday. Immediately after I was born, she had her tubes tied, which indicates to me she just didn't want children at all. So pretty much imagine a young girl, she has a kid she didn't want, pretty sure she didn't want any kids. She's she, Her life was made difficult. She's working three jobs, just trying to feed us and, and keep us sheltered. I was fortunate that my grandma decided she would get a job to pay most of my expenses and great grandma would care for me during the day since she was home. So I did have that love and that nurturing and that motherly aspect where I experienced love in that way. But from my mother, it was always distant and, and almost in a neglectful way, emotionally and physically. There was no soothing when I was upset or couldn't sleep at night because I did spend some time with her. But I eventually moved in with her when she found somebody she was going to marry. She got married to a man when I was seven years old. It was not my biological father. I didn't even know I had a biological father, honestly, because it hadn't occurred to me. I was just a kid living my life. I saw other kids had mom and dads, but I just had a mom and a grandma and a great grandma and some uncles and cousins. It just didn't occur to me that I was missing something. But my life really took a turn when my mother got married. So she married an older man who I recognized back then. I mean, this man was something, he was one way in front of people, boisterous and funny and charming and giving and generous and all these things. But then in our house or even in the car, sometimes leaving the family holidays or whatever, he was a nasty beast. I, I never liked him from the first time I met him. Actually, I, I don't want to give too much away because I actually just finished my second book and the publisher's reviewing it now. And it's about my childhood. But even on our, the first time I met him, 
there was a situation where I was physically hurt and he had no remorse. He just didn't care that he had done that to me. But the sad thing is neither did my mother. So here I am in this childhood, now in this new place. He had moved my mother into his house that was away from our family and friends outside the city of Chicago, which was all I'd ever known. And a lot of her family didn't have vehicles. People that live in Chicago, people have to understand, you usually don't have a vehicle. You rely on public transportation. So it, it was very limited in, in the time that I was able to see my family in Chicago because they couldn't get to us and we couldn't get to them for whatever reason, mostly because of time, because all my mother did was work. But it was really hard being in this house with him. So my mother worked constantly. I, I realize now, I think it was her distraction from, I mean, she had to know what kind of life she had chosen, but she had always been very concerned about wanting a house and wanting a car and wanting things because we didn't come from, we were, I shouldn't say poor. I mean, we grew up like I didn't have a bed in the apartment that we stayed in before moving in with him. And there were times when there wasn't a whole lot of food. I mean, love my Puerto Rican great grandma. She could always stir up a pot of rice and beans. And I lived on that. I didn't. And again, it's like not having a dad. I didn't think anything. I didn't think that we had any less. We just, we had what we had and it was enough. And, but my mother was always obsessed with like things and wanting more to her. That was success and achievement. And she didn't think she could have that alone. And, and looking back, I realized, I think she thought she could only have that with this man because he was attaining all these things if he didn't have them already. But it, it was just the constant back and forth with him and with her. It, it was like he was triangulating my mother and I against each other because I was often alone in the house with him. He was left to get me ready in the morning, get me to school. And it, it started with little stuff. And this is the thing about narcissists. It starts with little stuff. Like I'd always have my hair when I was little in two pigtails and he would pull my hair I mean, so tightly, the kids at school, and, and forgive me, I don't mean offense to anybody, mm. but he would pull so tightly, like it would stretch the skin on my face and my eyes back to where these ponytails were held, that the kids at school would make fun that I had Asian looking eyes because I mean, and I would get headaches. And if I yelped or, or squealed when pain, he would hit me with the hairbrush and it was little stuff like that. But I would go to my mother and she would tell me, oh, stop, you're just trying to get attention. You're just jealous of my relationship with him. I was a kid. Nobody was listening to me. But then it escalated to where he would start telling me the, the verbal abuse. I was starting to hear nobody ever wanted you. I shouldn't have to pay for another man's child. Nobody loves you, not even your mother. Nobody's ever going to love you. You're a burden. I was basically, I was a bother. I was a burden. I was stupid. As I grew, was growing older, getting on a roll wasn't enough. I wasn't smart enough. Being first chair viola in two symphonic orchestras wasn't enough. Teaching myself to play piano wasn't good enough. Writing my own music on piano wasn't like nothing was ever enough. And he would, I mean, he was very overt and very direct in how he would tell me these things. And I would stand up to him because I was a tenacious thing. And I realized, I mean, no matter how many times I went to my mother, she would just accuse me of lying or he would deny these things. So it was useless to go to her. All right. <laughs> now, all right. So that seems pretty intense. And I like the way you said that you were tenacious because you're. You know, <laughs> yes. You're, you're tenacious D, right? Okay. Exactly. But I'm interested to find out is if you feel like you were getting to the honor roll, getting to first chair, making all these amazing accomplishments for someone that young because you wanted his his approval absolutely i was absolutely the overachieving desperately seeking their approval 
kind of a kid. I mean, but I wanted it more for my mother, not more, not so much for him because that was my mother. And like I said, even before him, there was always this distance between us and, but him giving me this verbal, his words just, I internalized them, even though I knew he was mistreating me because my uncles didn't talk to me that way. My cousins didn't talk to me that way. I had little friends in the neighborhood. Their parents didn't talk to them that way. So I knew it was wrong, but it was my mother. I felt like I was always trying to convince her of my worthiness but Mm. she just wasn't interested. And I, in my mind, and I think most people can't comprehend that a mother just doesn't have any care or love for a child that came out of her womb. And it's very interesting. In the nineties, there was this book that came out. I don't know if you've read it. It's called a child called it. And It was one of the worst cases of child abuse in California history. But the reason I bring it up, I actually recently reread it. It's so horrifying. It's actually very triggering and difficult to read. But the interesting thing about it was that it was only one of the five children in that house that was abused so severely. The others had a perfectly normal childhood. They were perfectly aware, as was the father it was the mother abusing the one child everybody in the house was aware of it everybody saw it and nobody stopped it and i felt i mean for me i related to that so much because even though i was the only child it was still so frustrating that how could a mother treat i mean you think you have a baby you're supposed to love and protect and nurture and raise this child and love it. And I mean, we hear about cats rejecting some of their young, but you don't think people could do that. You would, it just doesn't seem to make sense. So that's what I struggled with was I wanted my mother's approval. Him, I didn't like him from day one. And honestly, even when I stood up to him and even though I was internalizing all these awful things he was telling me, I knew they were wrong. But it's just sad that come to when I was a teenager, it's hard enough being a teenager, especially a girl. You got your body's changing, you got hormones, and you're concerned with how you look and body image issues. And I mean, even that, I mean, I remember being five, six years old because we moved in with him but right before they got married. And he would tell me that, oh, that toast you're having for breakfast is going to make you fat. Or in my, I, I remember, I actually tell this story in my Uh, next book about how I was eating a bowl of pasta after cross country practice in high school. And he came in as I was taking a second helping. He's like, that's going to go all to your hips. All those carbs are going to make you fat like a middle-aged woman and like your grandma. And it was so offensive and, and I loathed him. But what did I do is I put down my spoon and I mean, I've tried to purge I've tried, I I went out for another run that night after running six miles at cross country practice. I went out till after dark, just running, like I got to get these calories off. He's right. I got, so people need to understand the power of their words. And I don't know how to explain, you just have to be one of these people that you can, you can know that somebody is, is saying wrongful things to you, but they still affect you. They still affect you because when you hear it all the time, and it was every day of my life there, and it was backed up by the physical abuse because that hadn't relented. There were a lot of issues. It it escalated from the pigtails, let me tell you. By by before I left the house when I was 18, the worst thing that had happened was I was strangled and thrown down a half flight of stairs. And unfortunately, child services, oh, we interviewed their the neighbors and the people that worked for them. And everybody says they're wonderful. They had created this narrative like all narcissists do. Anybody that knows a narcissist knows they've already told everybody behind your back about you're crazy and you're the problem. So I was made out to be this difficult, defiant daughter of theirs that they just did the tears at the police station. My mother, oh, we just don't know what to do with her. I mean, it was reminiscent of Rooster and Lily in the movie Annie sitting there pretending to be so forlorn and, oh, they lost their daughter Annie and they needed her back. It was all bull. But 
you know, nobody believed me. Nobody believed me. Nobody. Because out in the world, they presented as these charitable, wonderful, smiley, happy people who had a business of their own and helped family and and neighbors whenever they needed to. Nobody believed me. Nobody. So that's so disheartening. I mean, I can't even tell you my heart's in my throat right now. I do have just one quick question. And I, I just, just for mentality's sake, you mentioned that you were all symphony, you were across country and you got all these accomplishments and obviously, and we're going to get into this ladies and gentlemen, but this this young lady (laughs) over here went to DePaul university and the university of Chicago and the university of Chicago is very hard to get into. You might as well call it Ivy league, but you had all these accomplishments. So I'm wondering, what was the first, what would be the first thing that would go through your mind? You said that you were, you had made what all symphony is the first thing that went through your mind at that point. And I know, I'm, I know it's a, what it's a ways back, but was the first thing going through your mind? Yes, I did it. I was able to accomplish this or was it, yes, I did this for my mom or yes, I did this for this narcissistic. Ava. No, it was always, I can't wait to tell my mom, but okay. you know, over time I, it, when The best way I can explain it is that when over time, your successes, your accomplishments, your little achievements are just, they're not even acknowledged. It's just Mm. dismissed like it's any other day. And oh, that's all you got the thing, because that's how I was treated. You begin to think that's not enough. So it wasn't enough to be in two symphonic orchestras and be first chair in both. Now I had to, well, what else can I do? Well, maybe if I get the solo, maybe if I get the solo in the next concert, I can do it. Maybe if I, and I did, I got a few solo performances at different cultural festivals and and different performances that we did. And one of the symphonic orchestras traveled around. I mean, it was just endless. It didn't matter what I did. It wasn't enough. So I had to do more. I had to do more. So all I did was exhaust myself with trying to get my mother. I basically just wanted her to notice me at all, because even when I would try to talk to her, she was always too busy washing dishes. She couldn't come to any of my sporting events. She never went to, I always was one of those kids. When you go to like kids things at school, little recitals or whatever, I just feel so bad because there's always that one kid who's like eagerly craning his or her neck, looking out, hoping to see mom or dad. And that was me. And it just, it pains my heart because it, the kid is doing that because they know mom and dad probably aren't going to be there. And that was me. And and it's so frustrating to feel so insignificant and so unimportant when your parents are supposed to be the people encouraging you and supporting you, even if they couldn't be there to just pat me on the back and say, good job. But a B plus was, well, how come you didn't get an A? It it was just, it was never. and, And it's still to this day, we have no relationship. They have cut ties with me a handful of years ago for the third time in my life, but this is the final time. But I, I say now, I mean, I could win the Nobel Peace Prize and it won't be enough. I will have not have earned it younger at a younger age or it, it'll always, even when I graduated from college, well, that's like a kindergarten education compared to somebody else who has a doctorate. Okay, well. Oh, geez. And are they, and would you consider them successful? No. I mean, I credit them because honestly, who wouldn't? He never made it past sixth grade. He had a very troublesome childhood. He was actually, he and his four siblings were abandoned, like literally abandoned by both parents. I don't even think he was a year old, my stepfather. And so they were put into the foster system, separated. They are now reunited as adults, but very sad. And he was abused in those foster homes. And my mother came out of, you want to talk about a narcissist. My my mother's father was a raging alcoholic who liked to wield a gun and bring random women home and have interactions with them in front of my grandma and just hor- horrific things that my mother had to witness and grow up with. So I feel for them. I absolutely feel for them, but 
I, I know that they had a hard time. I know that they could only do what they could do and they did make the best of their situation. She had to drop out of high school because she couldn't stand the, the shame and judgment of being pregnant with me. He didn't make it past sixth grade for whatever reasons, but they did create together a business that has served them very well. They live in a ridiculously large and ridiculously showy home and he has Corvettes and classic cars and Harleys. But the thing is, it's all for show. And I want to honor that success. They literally came, went from rags to riches. I commend them for that. But at the same time, the need to have that admiration and that praise for having attained things, that requirements for exaltation because you acquired material possessions, that just repulses me because that was just at the premise of all of that supposed success. But that's narcissism. I mean, right there, that's narcissism. Yeah, that's a, like a typical definition. Okay, so let's move on. All right, so at yes. 18, you get you get to yeah. DePaul? You mm -hmm. started at DePaul or you started at University of Chicago? No, I went to DePaul. So sorry, I DePaul. went to DePaul. I did. I didn't even want to go to college. Honestly, I wanted to go to beauty school, but it wasn't good enough. It wasn't real school, I was told. So I went to DePaul. I grew up Catholic. I was raised Catholic. I figure I might as well go to Catholic University and I got in. So yeah, yeah I set out to be on my own. And I actually lived with my boyfriend at the time, but that didn't go anywhere good. He treated me very well. He was older, had his own place. So it worked out really well. But I feel like looking back, even though we cared about each other, it was, I hate to say it, but the reality was it was more of a tra transactional relationship. Mm. He liked the, the data boys from his friends for having a younger girl living with him and having that relationship. And I got a safe place to stay where I was treated like a human being. And he did. I mean, we were good friends, but there was a lot missing there. So when he started talking about marriage, I mean, it, it scared me because I, I was nowhere near ready for that. Right. So, so yeah, we split up a, a few months before I was 19 and I ended up moving into a real estate community that I was working in that management office. And that is where I met my ex-husband who walked in the office one day and that's where my story gasping for air starts. Right. So that's Darren, right? Yes. That is his name in the book. Okay. So, yeah. So it was interesting that in the book that you actually recognized. Now, I don't know if you were, exactly. if that was a hindsight. No, um, that was right was, then and there. <laughs> you make it sound just like that. Like oh, you yeah. recognize that. Wait a second here. This looks like a familiar situation. Oh, yeah. The robot in Lost in Space with his dangly yeah, little coily arms. Robot, danger, danger. danger. This right. is what I pictured in my head <laughs> because it was this, it, he was like arrogant and aloof, but I mean, I he was no Brad Pitt. Like there was no reasoning outwardly for this. Like I didn't know who he thought he was. I didn't see a car that that warranted this behavior like he was something and i don't know just he wanted servitude is all i felt from him and i was like no i know you buddy i don't want any part of it but the people pleaser in me the strange dichotomy in my head is that the people pleaser in me couldn't stand that he was keeping this distance like i i felt like he didn't like me and i couldn't stand if people didn't like me so I had to make him uh, like me. Okay. Yeah. So that explains a lot of where that went in that first chapter. Oh man. So <laughs> yeah, because you, um, oh, if I remember yeah. correctly, it's been a little bit, but if I remember correctly, you actually did like put your foot down and left, but you, but the problem was, is that you, what you, you exchanged keys and he ended up like just showing up and pretending like it never happened. Yeah. So, yeah. So he out of nowhere invited me over one night and I was like, oh, okay. So 
it, you know, he doesn't hate me. Like I, I, I don't like right. him much, but he doesn't hate me either. And we ended up, it's really sad to me. And, and this is the part, this is the beautiful thing about writing a book about bad experiences. And this is why I encourage people to journal is when you're reading it, when it's out of your head and on paper, and you can really be honest with yourself, there's an objectivity you look at things with. And when I was writing about these experiences, I thought, how sad, because like my son's girlfriend is 19 and, and I was just turning 19 then. And in that moment, wanting so eagerly for the this young man who was an entitled ass, honestly, he acted like a frat boy and he was disrespectful and rude to me. He made sexual advances and I let him have his way with me. Was it rape? No, but I didn't want it to happen. I wasn't trying to do that with him or anywhere near that with him, but I allowed it. And, and then, yes, we ended up, I just assumed, okay, we might as well be together because that's what he wanted after that. And I thought, well, I could, his parents were lovely. I met them, what, within a week? <laughs> and they were the loveliest people. And I thought, oh my gosh, he can't be that bad. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm missing. And here I have a childhood of my mother and stepfather telling me that I'm the problem. I'm looking at things the wrong way. I'm misinterpreting things the wrong way. So you, and you start to wonder if everybody's telling you this, then it must be me. So why not give it a shot? Maybe it can be okay, but it wasn't okay. And 25 years later, it was the furthest thing from okay. But that's how I think abusive situations and toxic relationships work. I always joke with people that it's not like women don't see Chucky running down the street with a butcher knife and say, hey, baby, come on hither. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> that's not attractive. Even Ted Bundy, the serial killer, handsome. He wore suits and he was charming. He didn't lure women because he outwardly expressed that he was a, a psychotic maniac. No, these are people that are luring us in. Although my ex had a strange way of going about it, but he lured me in. I was so eager for any crumb of attention and affection that I let him because there was nobody else asking me out on dates. There was nobody else interested, but I was also isolating. I stayed hidden away in my apartment with my cat because it was safe there. It was a, a safe place for me where people couldn't hurt me and nothing could happen to me. But this guy just wormed his way in. And, and it was the, I love you. It's you and me against the world. But then something bad would happen and he'd make me pay for it in some way. The problem is that when you're talking about a girl like me who had come from a childhood where I was basically love starved and emotionally abandoned, any slight little notion of having somebody's favorability worked for me. It was enough to overshadow all that bad stuff. But the mm. other problem was that I also didn't have boundaries because people pleasers, usually their boundaries are very flexible because it depends on what this person wants from you. And you don't want to say no and disappoint anybody. And that was absolutely who I was. So every time something bad would happen, you're right. As you were saying, it would be enough that I would take a stand and say, mm -mm, I'm out of here. Like that when the part where you talk about he threw something across the room at me. No, I'm done. I'm out. But then he comes to me acting like nothing happened and caressing my cheek and holding me and just what we're just going to pretend nothing happened and move on. And I'm thinking, okay. And I'm rational. I thought I was like, we all have bad days. We all have moments. We all, maybe something happened at work and then you might take it out on the person when you get home, whatever. We're all human. And I get that. And, and I give grace for that. But the problem with a narcissist or any abusive person or, or toxic relationship is that every time something bad happens, every time they get away with it and you don't end the relationship, the next time something happens, they push that boundary just a little bit further, just enough that it's uncomfortable for you that you don't like it, 
but not enough that it's a deal breaker, not enough that you're going to walk out and they know what they're doing. So when you look at point A to point B, I mean, certainly at the end of that 25 years, when I'm at the courthouse filing for an order of protection because this man wants me dead, I am literally sitting here thinking, how the hell did we get from point A to point B? This doesn't make sense to me. And nobody would even believe me then because his family had no clue. My family, well, my mother had seen some things. She'd witnessed things, but just like in my childhood, she looked the other way. I, I'll never forget the first time, one of the first times my ex put his hands on me in our house in the middle of our son's, I think it was his first or second birthday party. And I screamed for him to get his hands off me. My mother, I don't know if she was just coming out of the bathroom or whatever she appeared. We didn't know she was there. And she just looked and kept walking and walked away. I'm her daughter. I'm her daughter. Like somebody should have said, this isn't right. This isn't okay. But nobody said anything because nobody knew. And the few people who saw, they just let it happen. But how many times do we see this? I mean, look on social media. Somebody could be getting their, forgive my language, getting their ass oh. beat and everybody's taking videos and posting them on Facebook right. and TikTok. What the heck is wrong with people? Stop this. Yeah, no, that's an amazing thing that you just mentioned because I've seen it a lot. And yes. there's people that they take the videos, but no one does anything. Finally, when someone exactly. steps up, that person ends up being in trouble for some reason. Yes. A lot of exactly. the time. Exactly. <laughs> and all they're doing is trying to help. And yes. when this environment that we've come into is the, well, it, it's coming back down, but it, the Sioux society, basically yes. what it is. Oh, you've done this to me and you had no part of it. So I'm going to sue you. And now people are all sc scared of that. So eh, here's the video in case you need it, but I'm not going to help. And that's, yeah, it, it's just not American. Not in my, no, not in my it's vote. not. I mean, and that basically describes how that whole relationship ended even because even when I was in court trying to get an order of protection, I had to go, I was denied after a knife incident. I was denied after a gun incident. I was denied. They didn't see the urgency for it. And I'm thinking this system, I'm going to end up dead before this system acknowledges that I need protection. Now, he didn't serve one day in jail. I couldn't press charges against him for anything. Two incidents of domestic violence. I couldn't press charges. And then I recently learned, it's horrifying to think, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but even as recent as the 1970s in this country, women could not press charges against their husbands. How backwards is this? So this is part of why I'm on this mission to create awareness and why I'm so open about it, because there's so many people who are still in these situations, or maybe they're out, but they're afraid because of the consequences, the obvious ones to expose their abusers and what has happened to them. But we need to start taking responsibility as individuals and as a society for to prevent these things from happening, because I don't care what anyone says. I was sexually abused in my marriage. A piece of paper saying we're legally tied does not give the right to somebody to do things to me that I don't want to happen. There is financial abuse that usually is not recognized because if you're married, well, he drained a hundred thousand out of the, our retirement account without telling me, without telling me, but there's no recourse for that. The recourse was I had to come up with the tens of thousands of dollars to pay the tax liability on that, which I didn't have. So I had to go work harder for it and figure out a way to repay that to the IRS. Then there's legal abuse where people threaten divorce on the low end to the higher end where maybe you are divorced and they're not paying their alimony. They're not helping. Even at the end of my marriage, before we could legally file for divorce, we were just going into the COVID shelter in place. And so I couldn't, not only could I not file for divorce, but I had just been diagnosed with a lung disease as a direct result of the abusive situation I was living in. And he refused to work. He hadn't worked in four years and he refused to help 
work during COVID to save our house from foreclosure and save his wife who had a lung disease from being out in the world working with this virus that's killing people, beginning with the lack of oxygen. So it, there are all these things that abusive partners do that are not recognized by our courts, not recognized by our system. And, and the worst part of it is this very startling statistic. And let me say this as a preface, men and women alike are abused in relationships. However, I speak for women because I am one, 38% of all women murdered are murdered by their partner. That is scary. Wow. They're not murdered by perpetrators or 38%. It's by their spouse, their boyfriend, whoever they are in an intimate relationship with. So that's very startling and something we need to take a little more seriously. Wow. So the, so all the laws and orders and NCISs and stuff where they sit there and go, well, we have to look at the husband. Uh-huh. That's that, that is a That is where that's that is coming super from. Super high. It's 38%. Literally. Now, a lot of times when we're looking at this, we're looking at these shows and because they all sit there and say, well, it was because it, the show is fictitious, but it was based on facts and it was based yes. on there become like a, like a history, what they call it, like historical fiction right. where they're based on fact, but they're not, but they're not, it's fiction. Yeah. yeah. But, but that makes total sense. Now I'm like, yeah. now, now I'm not mad at them. Okay. So, so let's run down the things that you've learned that of the abuses that you just mentioned, let's list some of those off. And so people can understand, all right, what did you find that is recognized that you could get something oh. on the books as far as the law goes? And what are the things that are just not recognized at all you mentioned? So obviously physical abuse. Yes. And, and honestly, that's probably it. Physical abuse, unless you have black eyes and gunshots, or if you've been shanked, I mean, there were times I wanted him to hurt me just so I could have him jailed and, and put him where he should be. Because particularly the night he shot a gun outside my bedroom window late at night, at that point, we were actually already divorced. He had refused to take the house. So the house was redone in my name. I was the only one on the title and deed of that home. He had no part of it, no financial part of it, no legal right to it. I stayed there only because my son was in his last year of high school and I was trying to be a good mom and maintain right. some sense of normalcy and stability for him through all this chaos. But after this gun is shot, multiple times outside my bedroom late at night after he was hollering and screaming all kinds of vulgar, nasty things at me. I honestly thought, and people have to understand for reference, we didn't live in a city or a suburb. We are in a rural area. Like even though there was a town five to 10 minutes away, we were under county jurisdiction and county was about 45 minutes away. I'm on the phone with 911 huddled in a corner, honestly, knowing he can break down our very flimsy entry door of our older home and kill me. And I honestly thought he was going to read about That's it in the crazy. book, but the police, when they got there, he denied shooting the gun. They couldn't find a gun. I had a four acre farm. I had a cow paddock, I had a chicken coop, I had a 3,000 square foot barn with a second story and hay and wood piles, and it's in the middle of the night. We don't have street lights. Some of the roads aren't even paved. Of course, they didn't find a gun. On the four acres of property, God only knows where he hid it, but it was hidden and they couldn't find shells because it was dark and they weren't gonna scour a four acre property with multiple structures with flashlights. It was unrealistic. So they said that if I had video proof that he had shot the gun, they could do something. Otherwise, there was nothing they could do. And I was beside myself. I said, what did you do then before cell phones? What did you do before blink cameras? Because I'm pretty sure women were assaulted and abused 
before technology caught up with us. And it, it just was so appalling to me that I could be in my bed, in my house that I owned solely <laughs> and that this man was trespassing on my property, committing an act of domestic violence, and they would not let me press charges. They would not let him take him away. In fact, and again, this is all in the book, it is a very jarring night for me to know the reality of the way things work. They told me unless I had that video proof, they couldn't do anything. And I said, well, I, how am I supposed to just let you leave and go back to bed? And you won't even remove him from a property he is trespassing on. And they said, well, you don't have to stay here. I said, but this is my home with my son that he left <laughs> and, oh and he signed off. So, so that night I had to pack a bag and leave my house in the middle of the night. The three, there were six squad cars at my house. Three of them escorted me out. Three remained at, at my house with him because he refused to leave, but they wanted to make sure he didn't follow me. Well, why didn't they just remove him? I mean, I would have still probably left because I wouldn't trust that he wouldn't have returned. But, right. you know, them leaving, escorting me and leaving three squad cars behind to prevent him from following me told me that they didn't trust him either. But none of them would let me do anything. I couldn't file a report. I couldn't file charges. And it's just so ass backwards the way this all works. So what I learned and, and what I tell people, because obviously while somebody's shooting a gun directed at me, I'm not going to be standing there filming it like these other right. idiots do on social media. I just tell people spend the hundred dollars on a blink camera system. Everybody has Amazon. That was the first thing I did, by the way, the next day is I went and ordered them and they showed up and I'm going to tell you, I'm a 48 year old woman that I, I have a lot of wonderful abilities and lots of knowledge of things. Technology is not one of those. Mm. So if I can set them up, <laughs> it is very easy. Anybody can set them up, get yourself one of those video doorbells, get yourself a couple blink cameras, I, I had a smartphone, which I didn't have until after the divorce, but I had a smartphone where every time that camera sensed motion, I got the notification and I had a video recording. And let me tell you what, that was like having an invisible fence on my property because boy, did he simmer down after that. Knowing he was being watched, things got a lot better for me and I felt a lot safer. And it's a shame that we have to resort to these kinds of things, but unfortunately this is the world we live in. They are very clear and out here it's a little more lax than it might be in, in the bigger cities like Chicago and New York and LA, but video proof, you have to have video proof, spend the hundred dollars on the blink cameras. Absolutely. And one other thing I learned is that, at, which I was told, the first time I went for the order of protection, there was no record. I had never reported. Of course, I never reported anything. I'd never called the police for anything else he did before because I was scared. I didn't want to face the consequences of what would happen after whatever consequence he'd have to face legally, because it might be worse than whatever I was calling them for. And I didn't want to end up dead. So I never reported him. Plus, I had a child and my son had asked me many years before, please don't ever call the police on dad. I don't want to be that kid. I don't want to have to go to school and deal with the other kids and the other moms and have that stigma. And I promised that to my son because all I wanted for my kid with everything we were dealing with in the house, and he certainly still to this day doesn't even know the half of it but I just wanted him to have some kind of a normal life. I didn't want him to worry about that. So I never did file any reports. I never went to the cops. So that is a mistake that I made. Looking back, I wish that here's another tidbit for anybody. You can go to the police station. You can go to the county sheriff's office, wherever you live. You can make a report and just have it on file. 
It doesn't have to be something where they go and arrest the person or go interrogate the person, but you need that paper trail. Because if I had that paper trail of all these things that had happened, and let me tell you, there were plenty of them. I know, Brad, you said you, you've read part of the book. There was plenty that yeah. I could have probably reported over the years. And there's stuff that's not even in the book. But if I had that, I would have been granted that order of protection in the first place, the first time. I wouldn't have had to go back three times. And when you breach an order of protection, you are immediately taken to jail. So lesson learned because I didn't have to be in the position I was in. I put myself there, not that I had asked for it, but I also, I, I don't blame myself either because who the hell thinks about these things? Right. You don't actually think, I mean, even though like my ex had sent me emails and said things insinuating that he wanted me dead, you don't, like you said, you watch these shows. I watch 48 hours. You don't think your spouse is actually going to kill you. You don't think they're actually going to shoot you or stab you with a knife. Yet here I was almost in the situation where I was going to be stabbed with a knife, almost shot, almost, and nobody was protecting me because according to the law, there was no trail. There was no record. And I even remember the judge looking at me, a woman too, which kind of upset me when she said, so you've been with him 25 years and you just expect me to just out of nowhere, give you an order of protection. And I said, yes, actually I do. And she's like, well, there's no reason for it. I don't see oh any God. urgency. Be... And, and I remember leaving there crying and the bailiff even walked me out and patted me on the back. He was a, a a, a much older man. He probably should have been retired, but you know, that fatherly nature, he patted me on the back. He's like, it's okay, kid. It's okay. And he was getting me tissues and I wasn't sure it was going to be okay. I wasn't sure at all. So it, it's very harsh. You have to just please, I urge anybody, e even if you really don't think your spouse will do anything, it's unfortunate, but you have to have some kind of record. Do not bait them or provoke them but just have something that's in place that if something does happen, you can rely on it for to back up your claims. So, all right. So we've talked about, we've, we've mentioned a few things. So one is we said physical abuse, legal yes. abuse, financial abuse. Yeah. Uh, is there anything that I'm missing there? Sexual abuse. And sexual then there's abuse. just, I mean, there's the emotional, verbal, psychological, I mean, all the gaslighting, the manipulation. Mm -hmm. There's even, I, I, there's an aspect of medical abuse in there too. I touch on it somewhat in my book, but for example, it's actually a joke that all, every narcissist everywhere likes to call their victim crazy. You're crazy because it's not them. You're the problem. My ex had me so convinced that he kept saying I was bipolar. And I mean, he had me so convinced that I was actually an unfit mother because I was bipolar that I went to a psychiatrist just to make sure because my, I mean, my son was everything to me. He was about two years old at the time or just going on to, and I answered all the questions at the psychiatrist correctly. I answered his questions as my then husband was telling me that this is how I act and this is what, and I left there with two mood stabilizers and Xanax for the quick calm downs. I was on those medications for 17 years. And you want to know the kicker of it is that since the divorce and since I've been open about what was really happening behind closed doors, my psychiatrist apologized to me in one of my follow-ups because He's like, I'm so sorry. He's like, you were just having normal reactions to abuse. But after more recent evaluations, I was taken off. I was weaned off the medications because they were pretty hard hitters, but I, they retracted the diagnosis. I wasn't bipolar at all. It's just that obviously I was in situations that were causing me tremendous mental angst. And, yeah. but yes, on Christmas, I could sit there and be happy opening presents with my son. And I could laugh at jokes when I was at a family gathering or a barbecue and I, I could cheer on the teams at the school. And so it wasn't that I was having ups and downs. I was just trying to live my life and not let 
our circumstances behind closed doors, I mean, of course they affected me, but I didn't want them to define, inhibit my ability to live a life that I deserved. Although it's strange that I had no self-respect or self-love to get myself out of the situation, yet I wanted to give myself whatever aspects of a normal life that I could, just like I was trying to do for my son. Right. Okay. So recognizing all this physical, but mental, financial, emotional, sexual, legal. Yeah. legal. So we have to recognize all of this. What would you say? So we've, and you've touched on a little bit of a little bit of advice is one, get your cameras for outside yes. in case of anything else but you know what you can recognize even that whether inside. you even if you believe that you're in a good relationship i would rec- i would say spend yeah. the money for blink blink's great it have is. them myself they're awesome i'll link to some cameras in the show yes. notes recognize that and two you mentioned in the on the physical side if you feel like you're getting if you're phys- physically you're getting physically abused and some of the it takes some of the examples that dana's given and like she said Go to the police department and just file a report. They don't have to make it public. You just right. file a report, tell them to keep it on file. Now right. you've got you've got a paper trail so that, exactly. you can, that you can go forth from there. What about some of the others? Can you do the same thing? If like, so he, you said that he had taken out $100,000 and obviously that's easy to get to get evidence yeah. because when you come to the bank, okay, oh, right, whose debit card was it that took it out or who's who put the order in or who went to the bank and took it out? That's easy. Can you do that? Can you bring that to the police and make a report as well? No, unfortunately not because I mean, he was even taking out credit card. He wasn't working the last four and a year, half years of our marriage because he said he didn't have to work anymore. He apparently decided that he could retire at, at 40 years old and that was okay. He actually told me, get to it, is what he said to me when he decided that I needed to support us, which I scrambled to do, but I did. But, you know, that's legal abuse or that's financial abuse as well. But no, unfortunately not. When you are legally married to somebody, the way the courts look at it, the way our, our judicial system looks at it is that Basically, one person's actions speak for the others. So he was able to take credit cards out in my name and rack them up. He racked up $100,000 in debt. And by the way, he didn't use that $100,000 that he drained from the 401k to pay any of that. I had to pay all that off too. And even in the divorce, I wanted so desperately to be rid of him that I took everything. I, I was like, that's fine. I will take all the debt. I will repay everything back myself. I will do all of that. I just want to be done with this man. I just want to be done. He could have whatever he wants. I will take the brunt of everything. Just cut me off from this man because I couldn't take it anymore. And so, and that's, that obviously is a normal thing. And I understand that one one as well, but the next thing would be, would you do the same? Would you make that same choice? If you were in it today, I'm um, looking back, make the same choice. hundred percent. Fine. Take it. I'll take it and go forth. I had said from day one, and here's another little fun fact. The sixth and seventh attorneys I talked to, well, it takes a victim of abuse about seven attempts before they actually leave the situation. <sighs> It was the seventh attorney I spoke to that I finally got my divorce because attorneys were trying to talk to me about what I was entitled to and what I should do here. And with that, all I told every one of them, I just want my kid and I want to be done. I don't care if he takes all my money. I don't want the damn house. It was the house he wanted. I don't want, I have terrible memories in that. I don't want it. I, he could have my car. He could have my panties. He could, I could replace everything. I cannot replace me and my kid. I can make more money. I can replace things. I can't replace us. But they don't, from a legal standpoint, they don't get it. Like they don't understand that I just wanted to be done. So, I mean, I was fortunate that the seventh attorney I spoke with 
was actually a, a referral from somebody that we knew mu mutually, a judge that I knew. So I was very, I impressed upon him enough that please just do this for me. Just please trust me on this, that I just need this to happen the way I need it to happen. I don't want him contesting it. I don't want to fight over couches and alimony and I just want to be done. And I'll be darned, he had me divorced within three weeks of our first tel telephone conversation. Oh, well, that was good. At least some, yes. somebody was on your side at that point. Yes. That had to feel a little bit different. It it was unusual for me, but I was so glad. It, it, it oh. was, I, I mean, I'm breathing now because the the relief, but I will say this and people have to understand. And it's the same thing I told my son because I didn't tell my son I had even filed for divorce. So he didn't know about it until afterward. But right. I said that piece of paper that's saying that we're divorced does not change the re relationship. The two incidents of the worst incidents of domestic violence happened after the divorce. The relationship does not end. Believe me, I wish it did, but it does not end. So you have to be prepared for the worst, even when you think you're clear and free. What would, what advice would you give for someone that finally was able to get a divorce or got Lisa was able to get filed? What would be your advice knowing what you know now? Be very careful. Be very careful. He was stalking me. He was threatening me. He was, he even told my next door neighbors that he was planning to kill me, which like I said, there, there were some incidents. I think it's just, I, I go back to what I said cameras look over your shoulder i mean even when i was going to work he would be sitting on the corner watching me drive by in areas that he didn't need to be in or would not normally be he was stalking me and intimidating me so you just have to stand your ground and protect yourself make sure it, we don't want to necessarily expose our abuser because we're afraid but you have to make other people aware. One of the things that I did was I had somebody that I trusted. I told her that I would either email or text her every morning by 9 a.m. And I said, if you do not hear from me by 9 a.m. every single day, please contact the police to do a wellness check. So, so have an, have an I, advocate. I, Exactly. And I said, please don't ask any questions. Please don't ask me to explain. Just please do this for me. And she was gracious enough to let me. And we're beyond that point now. So I don't have to have somebody checking in with right. me every day. But it just to say, all is good. Have a great day. Just something. Have somebody aware of your situation or aware that you need to be accounted for just in case something does happen. Right. Would you like suggest, okay, if this is going to happen and you feel like there's any type of threat, even the minimalist one, I would be thinking, okay, I need to new cell phone number, completely new cell phone number, go someplace where they don't have no clue where you might be. Now you still got to go to work. And I understand that. So, but I would say, let your coworkers know that this is happening. What do you think about that? I think it depends on the situation because of course okay. there's a spectrum. Some people, things don't get to this point where it's this tense and hostile. Some people are in much worse situations. So I think you have to, I always tell people my advice for everything in any relationship is trust your gut. I used to think that I was being paranoid. I mean, there was a point towards the end of the marriage, even where he kept coming at, you may not have gone to the point in this, in the book yet, where he was coming in and out of the house, even though he had moved out of it. And he was doing things that were just to make his presence known and present like, you can't stop me. I am all powerful and I'm going to do what I want to do. It got to the point where I thought I was a crazy woman because before I would get in bed every night, I was pulling all the sheets and covers to make sure there wasn't like a scorpion or a snake in there looking under the bed. And to somebody that has not been in this situation, even me, I'm laughing. So I'm like, that's, that's so ridiculous. But I honestly, he wanted to hurt me and I, he didn't want to get his hands dirty. They never do. So, I mean, that's, I was having these paranoid thoughts, like I better do these things. 
you don't think you should have to, but you do. And if, if you're finding yourself in these situations, like I said, trust your gut. Don't say I'm being paranoid and delusional. That'll never happen. It's silly to think that because look at all the people it does happen to. Look at all these things we hear about on, on podcasts or on these true crime shows that it's like, oh my gosh, you can't even make this stuff up. No, you can't, but somehow these people do and they do these things. So the situation best, and I'm going to even go so far as to offer one more little piece of advice, which is something I did before he moved out and before I was able to file for divorce. And again, it was during COVID, so I was stuck, but you know, you never know with their moods. They could be having a great day and treating you eerily nice and, and being very sweet and affectionate. And then five minutes later, turn on you. I had what I called a grab and go case, $50 at Walmart. It was a small handheld fireproof, waterproof safe with a key for a lock. And I put copies of my driver's license, any of my bank state, you know, like a, a list of my bank statements and numbers and whatever any of my sons and my important documents, like our birth certificates, passports, that kind of stuff. That was all in that little case. I also put cash in there. If I grandma give me 20 bucks for my birthday or something, I was saving in there for 15 years because I knew if I had an opportunity where I could take my son and go, and it was safe for us to go, that I'd at least have money that I could buy us some food, or if I needed to pay for a place to sleep at night, I had all our important stuff. So there would be no reason to go back because like I said, I can get new clothes. I can get TVs. I can get, I just wanted the stuff that I didn't have to worry about going back for. I even had a hard drive. God love technology. I had a hard drive where I had downloaded tax returns and all this stuff from my computer and kept it in that safe. Family pictures, all that stuff, now that it's all digital, they were all on that hard drive. So I just kept that drive in that safe. I There was no need for me to have any reason to ever go back. So if I needed it, I could grab and go. And he never knew I had it. I kept it hidden. I even moved my hiding spot every once in a while. I hid the key. Sometimes I forgot where I hid the key, but <laughs> I, I found it. I always found it. But you just have to you have to put things into place. The other thing I did, one one more thing, if I can offer it, because I, I watch a lot of 48 hours, these, these shows, like you say, yeah. and what's usually a big motivator, money, money. They get life insurance policies on you, or they want the one that you have. They want money and things. So what I did, I went to my bank. I made sure that my son, even though he was a minor, was assigned as the only beneficiary on any of my bank accounts on the house. I had an annuity. I had other whatever financial assets I had. My son was the beneficiary and I had a very good friend of 20 some years who is probably the only person on this earth that I've ever trusted to this extent. I assigned her as the trustee that if something happened to me, that she would ensure that everything I had, any asset I had went to my son. I didn't even tell my, my then husband because he just assumed he would be the beneficiary on any of my life insurance policies and that he would get the car and he would get the house. No, the joke would have been on him. Everything would have gone to my son and would have only been for my son. And that's that. And, and I'm not ashamed that I did that. It's just a shame that people put us in the situation, not just to live these secret lives, but to have to go to these same secretive extents that they do to basically make up for all the chaos that they cause. But it made me feel better to know that I had a set will in place, that I had my assets going only to my son, and that he would be taken care of at least in whatever way I could take care of him if something were to happen to me. That makes pure sense. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put one thing out there, and I'm not affiliate for this, but I have this surface. It's called Presidio dot com p r i s i d i o and basically what it is an encrypted 
place for all of your documents. So oh, um, a place where you, you can put PDFs, you can put that there and it's all, it, it's encrypted, it's multi-factor authenticated, but I have copies of my license. I have copies of my yes. passports. I've got copies of the deed to my house. I have the yes. copies of all my insurance. I have all the copies. It's all there. It's all digital. And the only people, uh, and I have set people that have the password and the multi-factor oh. authentication to have that. Is that so? I would say that's one thing. Uh, that's obviously, the brilliant. And pictures and everything else. Yeah. And it's all there. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, and they've got ways for you. It's, a, there's a wizard in there saying, okay, do you have these documents? These go here. These are these documents. These go here. And it's all laid out. And if you ever need it, you can get it on your phone. You forget your, and what's nice is like, you forget your driver's license somewhere. Ah, it's in my driver's yeah. license, in my Presidio. I can just pull it on up and say, hey, listen, I forgot my driver's license, but this is a copy of it. Anyway, so I would recognize that again, yes. that's, I'm going to put that in the show notes. So, but let's go on to happier thoughts. So after yeah. this is all over, how did you meet your new husband? Well, I, small town, gotta love these small towns. I knew his family for about 20 years, so it, it was easy. He was always there, but the beautiful thing about coming out of a toxic relationship, and, and I have said this many times, but I felt like I was like this flower in a garden who had all these weeds overshadowing me, not letting right. me see the sun, and they were sucking the nutrients out of the soil so I couldn't get any nourishment. And once, I hate to say, my mom and stepdad, like I said, they decided to cut ties with me. They were Those weeds were gone. My ex was gone. His whole family decided to abandon me. I had other family that decided to side with my mother and stepfather. So all these weeds, once they were all gone, it's like, oh, the sun is shining. And there were some other flowers there and they'd always been there, but I couldn't see them through all the weeds. So it was a beautiful thing to realize that even though I had felt so alone and I felt so distraught and, and, and destitute and lonely, there were always other flowers there. There were always people there. And one of them was my now husband. We knew each other. Like I said, I, I was actually friends with his sister-in-law for a very long time. And my son is friends with some of his nephews and they went to school together. So, I mean, you know, a lot of intertwining there, but he was there and he just felt bad. He had been seeing things, even though he didn't know everything he was seeing and hearing things and just had concern and reached out. And it was strange. I, I tell people now that it baffles me that you can meet people in life. Very few people. We're lucky if we meet one, whether it's a friend or a co, you just click with that person. Just everything just aligns perfectly. Like, where have you been all my life? You're finishing my sentences. You think exactly what I'm thinking. That was what I felt with him. But obviously I never interacted with him in any way where I would have known that because I was busy being married to the, this maniac. And that would have been, would not have been right anyway. But yes, he was there. We He reached out. He was concerned. And the more we got to know each other, I mean, it just like, it, it was just like that click. It was like, where have you been all my life? So it, it all happened very fast. And it happened a lot quicker than people like to see because it was like, wait, you just got divorced. Yeah. Now you're engaged. And it's like, but it's different when you're in your 40s because- right. I knew what I, I didn't need to be married again. That was the last thing I thought I would actually, I had said many times, the last thing I'll ever do is get married. I don't need to deal with somebody's crazy ex-wife and their kids that hate me because I'm not their mother and whatever. But this man and I, it's like, we just developed a beautiful friendship and that was the basis. And even though he didn't understand a lot of what I went through because he was from this very close, very loving and tight knit family we just meshed and it just worked. And oh. it's such a beautiful thing when it just happens that way. Like I wasn't looking for it and there it was. And so, yes, we are married. And I love that even though my son was 18, when we got married, he sees another man treating his mom like a queen. And I always say it's like princess and the pea over here. I'm, my, my husband handles me and, and treats me like a delicate flower, but I always say I'm a delicate flower, but I might still punch you in the nose. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 
we have a great relationship. And the thing about it that people I think have an issue, but which I want to address because it is important. After a relationship like I had, yes, I wanted to, I was literally heading for the hills. I was planning to go to North Carolina, hide away. My son was going to school in Wyoming. I was just going to live my life, be a writer, do me. But it, it was so helpful to my healing to have somebody, that friend that was encouraging me and speaking words of positivity after a childhood and a marriage full of insults and degradations and diminishment to have somebody speaking, like I said, just positivity and encouraging me and telling me that I had more potential and more worth that I even thought I had it helped me to see it too. It was like having a crutch that until you can walk on your own two feet again, you just need a little help. So I'm not telling everyone to run out and, and find the first person and, and get married, but certainly dip your toes in the water and don't isolate yourself because just because you've had some bad experiences, I had lifelong abuse. My heart was still open and I'm thankful it was because at the end of the day, we all want connection. We all we're human. We want love and we're all deserving of love. No Nobody's broken or damaged or any of these awful things we like to call ourselves. We are just affected by our, our previous circumstances, but we are still capable of having healthy relationships. And I think that is a huge lesson. So yes. it's, you deserve it. You don't deserve this, all these abuses that you're going through. You do not deserve if you're getting physical abuse, if you're not, or legal or financial or sexual, you don't deserve that. What you do deserve is a loving relationship and yeah. someone that treats you like a human being and like you should be treated. Yes. So recognize some of these things. Um, and if you have any questions, make sure you reach out to Dana. You can grab her at www.danadiaz.com, which will also be linked in the show notes. And then also grab the grab her book, which is which again is called Gasping for Air. The Stranglehold of Narcissistic Abuse on Amazon, again, which will be linked in the show notes <laughs> and, and it's also on our website. So that's that. And then keep looking out because it sounds like you've got some other books coming your coming I our way. I do. I do. And I want to just point out one thing about Gasping for Air. It is available in ebook because as somebody who would not have been able to have a book that says abuse on the cover, I wanted to make that available in ebook form so that if somebody just wanted to have it on their phone or Kindle and not show that they're reading something like that, it is available. I wanted to be sensitive to everybody's circumstances. Yeah. And if you are a member of Amazon Kindle Unlimited, it's then free. it is in, she put it in that, in, in that library. So I want to thank you for that because yes. it makes it very easy for us. And yes. yeah, while I think that people should own the book, it's definitely a way for you to take a re or to read it. And let me tell you something, and I'm not done with it. And it's just because <laughs> of the number of interviews that I have to do with people with right. books, which I, but it is a page turner. <laughs> Dana is Everybody very, says that. <laughs> Dana is very good. She's excellent at putting words together that will keep you intrigued, but just don't take away. Don't let it take away the message. And if you recognize anything that's going on with her, then make sure that you get help. So anyway, with that being said, and with the fact that my, my camera just went out again, <laughs> I'm going to say thank you, Dana, so much. We really appreciate you coming on and I'm, and I'm hoping to see you again. And maybe we can tackle something else. Maybe when the next book comes out, yes, that we can would be have fabulous. you back on and we can continue on to see how, how your family is flourishing now that you found someone that, it, that appreciates you for who you are. I would love that. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right. And thank you. Thanks for joining us, everyone. And I will see you in the next one. <laughs>